Africa's Murchison Falls, where the peaceful Victoria Nile pours through jaws of rock to become the Devil's Cauldron. For the world's largest living terrestrial animals, this was the fountainhead of creation. Along these shores, fauna still flourishes, much as it did before the Pleistocene epoch, one million years BC. Enormous crocodiles, relatives of the scaly monsters that may have helped kill off the dinosaurs, prey upon land animals drawn to water, including men. To study Africa's internal shorelines, one of the world's great natural water systems, men of Calypso have traveled inland to the headwaters of the Great Rift Valley's intricate chain of rivers and lakes. Here they will investigate the shores that support the last great animal kingdom and attempt to photograph both above and below the water the behavior of the hippopotamus, the behemoth the Greeks called river horse. The hippo is usually peaceful, but when aroused, it may become 7,000 pounds of flesh and fury. The men of Calypso would dive with them. Along the shores of East Africa's Lake Tanganyika, longest freshwater lake in the world and second deepest, a beach cleared of brush symbolizes civilization's advance. Nomads become fishermen, hunters become herdsmen, poachers become planters. In this ancient land, wild elephants and other animals of the plains, as well as wild hippos, which ages ago were forced to seek sanctuary in the water, have now all become incongruous neighbors of exploding human populations. Once transient tribes are now wedded to the water in pumpkin patches, in an uneasy proximity, people and wildlife are in competition, dependent upon the same fluvial ribbon of life. The territory that intrigued Livingston decades ago today lures Cousteau away from the sea to these inner shorelines. Life is everywhere supported by water. The ocean shores are vital to thousands of animals, but inland shores are just as essential. Dr. Murray Watson, ecological surveyor, is our consultant in our study of the hippo, a dramatic example of dependence upon the water lines. A baby hippo clambers upon its mother's slippery back. The infant rides his mother's back for both play and protection. He feels secure, but dares not stray. A 16-foot crocodile haunts the water's edge. Herds of hippos leave the water to feed on grass at night. Unlike the elephant and rhino, the hippo has sensitive skin and would die under prolonged exposure to the equatorial sun if it fed only during the day. 
On land, the crocodile gives way. From an observation tower, Michel Delois will attempt to film the group behavior of hippos. When not disturbed, they spend up to 13 hours a day in the water. Energetic young bulls pass the time in mock battles, while the adults appear content to relax in the buoyancy that takes their oppressive weight off their feet. When they are fully grown, hippo males may become violent jousters, inflicting severe wounds on one another with their great shear-like canines, which throughout their 35-year lifetime never stop growing. Michelle captures the closing of a hippo's nostrils as it exhales and changes its specific gravity to submerge. Nearby, Cousteau and Dr. Watson. Now, it is my belief that a thousand years ago, maybe a little more, hippo spent much more time during the day feeding, but they're not very rapid. They can't run along the ground very fast. They are very good meat. The Africans here, these people, they love to eat hippo. Lots of fat in it, very fat. It's their f most favorite meat. And so um, the hippo was hunted a lot with spears, with bows and arrows, considerably hunted. And as a result, it became more and more nocturnal. There's something that amazes me. These, these animals are peaceful grazers. Nevertheless, they have these two gigantic teeth inside the mouth. What for? Um, for fighting among themselves. Intraspecific intra aggression. The males fight for territorial rights and for rights over females, for mating rights, that is. And they will also attack any predator which is in their way, like crocodile in the water. Crocodile? Yes. They are the major killers of crocodile. Well, I'm not surprised because these teeth are like swords. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, there are two curved teeth at the bottom curved. going to sockets, and there are two peg like teeth about this long in the top. Yeah. and they act against each other like that and it's a big shearing edge yeah. it can cut a man in two yeah. you say they can cut a man in two would they they have it's quite common oh, it has been done it happens yes it may happen to your one of your team who knows what do you mean <laughs> Cousteau and his men will now attempt to photograph hippos underwater. The hippos frequent the more shallow shores of Lake Tanganyika. To turn away possible attack, a bang stick is loaded with a single shotgun shell. The men's presence noted, the hippos disperse up shore. We enter the water quickly in an attempt to corral the fleeing river horses. <laughs> Philip's underwater camera records our first glimpse of a hippo running at great speed along the floor of the lake. The turbid waters obscure our vision, and hippos become ghostly shadows prowling into nothingness. Cousteau and the divers seek clearer water and unexpectedly encounter Africa's deadly water cobra. The hippos have disappeared. Gliding among metamorphic rocks, we are diving in another age 
or maybe through space for a landing on a crater of some watery moon. The crater is a nest laboriously dug by the male tilapia, a mouth-breeding fish. Here, the female lays her eggs, and after they are fertilized, she takes them into her mouth for incubation and to protect them against small egg-eating fishes. Upon birth, the babies stream from their mother's mouth. Youngsters don't wander very far and swim back into their mother's mouth at the approach of danger. The babies will grow to become splendid trout-like fish protected through infancy by their parents. Sedimentary rocks become headstones for an open grave. Alas, poor crocodile. Perhaps you knew an enraged hippo too well. Did you attempt to savage a hippo baby with these great jaws? You were once worshipped as a god in ancient Egypt, but you seem to have fallen from favor. You are said to seize livestock and people in your teeth and hold them underwater to drown. You suffer from a bad reputation. Suddenly a live crocodile. The bang stick is used merely to poke and redirect the animal. Captain Cousteau finds that they have swum into a nest of crocodiles. Cold-blooded and cold of eye, it is impossible to tell what a crocodile will do. Bernard continues to fend them off, but the men have come for hippos, not heroics, and Cousteau calls off the dive. The size of the lake and turbid water conditions have made the hippo inaccessible. The river horse still has full range. Unconfined within the vastness of the lake, he can easily avoid us. We have to conceive a better way to approach the elusive herd. At Cousteau's base camp at Cassaba Bay, on the southern tip of Lake Tanganyika, a carefully wrapped object in a wooden crate arrives from France. It is the subject of growing curiosity. Finally, the covering is removed. <laughs> the monster, a life-sized plastic hippo, is the creation of Jean-Charles Roux, renowned designer in Monaco. Its head has an aperture at the mouth for a diver's underwater camera. When the rest is attached, a second diver will bring up the rear. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> 
They'll be completely taken in by You're serious? Yes. I, I, I mean, if I was a hippo at, at 10 meters, you know, I'd consider this one of the more attractive specimens. Yeah. Well, that may be. That may be. Is it a male or a female? Female. <laughs> yes, definitely. So the males are going to be interested yes, in it. Whoever is in the back, it better be, <laughs> better be ready for action. <laughs> Lucky Bernard promoted to captain of our hippopotamus. He draws the forward of photographing position. Assignment, approach the hippos. It is hoped that our Trojan hippo will infiltrate the herd. Our divers and the painted lady from Monaco, nicknamed Lolita, enter the unknown. Within the plastic hippopotamus, Calypso divers approach the herd. A crocodile lies waiting, intentions unknown. A camera is encased in the model's mouth, ready to photograph hippo behavior at close range. As the herd becomes uneasy, our divers, hoping to halt the hippo's flight, submerge. The hippos appear suspicious. Do they notice that the eyes of our vamp do not close? that her ears do not wiggle. Instead of being intrigued, the hippos shy away. As our divers pursue, they are threatened. A great bull runs away. His sure senses must tell him that the painted lady from France is not to be trusted. For our discouraged divers, it is like returning from a party in a costume that fell flat. Only the wise and ageless elephant has the savoir-faire to ignore the failure of this long-legged mutation from Monaco. Along the shores of Lake Tanganyika, Captain Cousteau and Dr. Murray Watson discuss the problems of filming the hippos here. I begin to really like that place but we have a tough time for the filming mm. because uh, the water in the lake is now very tough. I suppose it's the season. Do you know if, uh, if it's always like that? No, not, not always. Um, you get these strong winds yes. and it brings up cold water just from time to time. And you get these plankton blooms. Oh, yes. But um, I think it may clear here, but you have possibilities 
in streams. You know, you get these fast-flowing streams. Yeah. They clear the mud from the when hippo are in the bottom. The mud is washed away by the current. Yeah. So it's a chance. You know, we must look at the places. Philippe Cousteau will accompany Watson on an aerial reconnaissance to locate hippos in clear water pools. They head for the remote areas south toward Zambia's Luangwa Valley. Murray Watson, who conducts wild animal surveys for the East African Wildlife Society, has a vertically mounted aerial camera on his plane. A radar altimeter, calibrated for the camera lens, records the height at which each photograph is taken over the network of virgin rivers. Fire lines along the river hungrily eat the grasses, heretofore harvested by hippos. More and more animals are being forced into unfenced buffer zones near parks and preserves. Before marginal land is put under the plow, it is systematically burned off. 375 air miles into Zambia's interior, Watson spots the telltale boil of hippos below. Eruptions reveal the presence of secret hippo colonies. A closer look. And then home. At their base camp on the shores of Tanganyika, Captain Cousteau awaits their report. How was it? Very good, fantastic. Yeah? Good point. Yeah. Show me. <laughs> Let's find it out. Uh, now. OK, so we flew from yeah. uh, the lake yeah. all the way down to the Luangwa Valley. There are some clear water pools. We've seen hippos. There's three, four big groups of hippo. Yeah. Crocodile. What do you call big groups? Several? One was about 60. What? And, yes. Big, 60? Big, big, yeah, big group. lots yeah. of them. And, 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 and another crocodiles. one was about, what, half dozen, yes. dozen? Yes. Crocodiles. Yes. Crocodiles. Yes. Big fish. Everything. From the air, we couldn't land there. Yeah. But uh, from the air, the water seemed very clear. Yeah. We can do some good work there and, and get really a feel of the animal in the water. What was 375 miles by air becomes 1,500 miles of difficult overland travel through bog and thornbrush. Old deserted tracks narrow to game trails which must be cleared for passage. Deep into the African wilderness they travel.
After our difficult trip to what appeared to be the inaccessible, we are rewarded by the late afternoon pastel ambers of Africa. From the nearby pools come the roaring grunts of hippos. It is to this area, unmarked by the inroads of civilization, that, to avoid persecution, emigrant hippos from great distances have come. Who knows how many perished on the way before they found year-round water deep enough to submerge their bulk and river grass sufficient to sustain them. Here is the end of our search, a concentration of hippos confined within the narrow boundaries of clear water pools. At the Luanga Valley Pool, paired off hippos prepare to mate. Mating, like birth, takes place underwater. Nearby, Cousteau examines a hippo trail dug out by herds that feed by night. They up here, they go to their meadows here, yeah, yeah, and then come back when they're fed. How far do yes. they go at night? Six miles. Six, six miles. Mm -hmm. Sometimes more, but six miles is is about at the normal limit. If it was very dry, they'd go ten miles. When they start finding good grazing, ten miles away, they make wallows and enlarge them and enlarge them, and then they colonize areas away from the river. They just lie in the mud. After consuming up to 200 pounds of grass during the night, hippos bake under mud packs, which help them maintain an even body temperature. They become easily overheated, and when the wallows begin to dry, they must return to the pools. At the pools, Murray Watson indicates that the hippos are becoming restive as mating fever spreads throughout the herd. In the mating season, the mature, longer tusked males must reaffirm their dominance. Now they are Males, females, and babies yeah, in the yes, pond. Yes. And uh, what's the ratio about it? Do they have as many males as females? I think they do, yes. Adults, about one to one. One but, to one. Um, a lot of males are excluded from breeding, just like all these um, ungulates. A lot of males never breed. An older male is cast out and a younger bull takes his place with the besieged female. Cousteau is concerned for the safety of his divers. As we judge our chances of filming these agitated animals, they appear to be judging us. Cousteau does not want to expose the men to the unpredictable hippos during their seasonal excitement. Philippe and Guy Jouar rig a raft with two cameras, one at water level and one unseen beneath the surface. From the opposite shore, Bernard Delamont helps direct the camera raft toward the herd. Philippe's line will be used to trigger the cameras to begin filming once the hippos are within range. It is a cautious approach to the fractious animals. The camera is nearly in filming range. How close can they get? Mm -hmm. 
With astonishing speed, a huge hippo has escaped under the rope. The men are still hopeful of containing and filming those that remain. Philippe gets an unexpected water level shot. The violent charge has been turned back by the ropes and the raft. The animals can retreat no further. They are at the end of the pool. Unwilling to be forced upon land, a second hippo attempts to flee to the other end of the pool. The remaining hippo suddenly shies away and makes for shore. The enraged hippo, larger and more formidable than the rhino, could rip apart anything in its path with one swipe of its razor-sharp tusks. With nothing to attack left in sight, the hippo returns to the water. With explosive fury, it charges the raft. Entangled in the rope, the bull dives. Then Philippe sees he has gone berserk. The debris is hauled ashore. One camera has been demolished, valuable film ruined. The scheme to avoid a dangerous dive has failed. Now, when the uh, raft was pulled very close to the hippo, uh, I don't know what happened underwater, but this camera was underwater and was totally wrecked. But what also happened is that after the first shock onto the raft, the hippo kind of climbed over it, jumped out of the water, landed on top of it, yeah. and proceed on trampling it before it went away. I think, uh, I think maybe the ropes maintaining the raft uh, frightened him into thinking he was going to be uh, trapped. trapped or captured. And look at this thick plastic broken That's pieces. really strong stuff, is it? Now that's the interesting piece because this plastic is made to withstand 11 atmosphere yeah. of pressure. This yeah. is 11 kilograms per square centimeter. But introduced slowly. Yeah. And there this is a shot. crash. Powerful animal. Yes, well, I guess, you know, the head probably weighs 200 pounds. It can probably move at 40 feet per second. Yeah. Nothing survives that. Well, you'd need an enormous camera, enormously armored camera to sustain that sort of blow. See, I mean, yes, when we go in the water, we'll have, uh, <laughs> we'll have to be very careful. Now to film these testy creatures underwater, the Calypso team has no alternative but to dive with them. At the clear water pools, the rutting hippos are still in an agitated state as plans proceed for the photographic venture both above and below the water. Michel can uh, sit in the branch there, filming while uh, you, Philippe, can take the other water shots. Um, well, no, and I will dive, yeah. probably from the other end of the pool, and bring them back toward the tree. What do you think will happen? I couldn't say. I think they'll, I think they'll go ahead of you, and when they get to shallow water, they'll come back past you. That's what I expect. But they might attack you. You must have your, really, your um, safety stick. 
The pool is not inhabited by the hippos alone. Now, uh, it's easy to see the hippos because they come back to the surface to breathe. But the cocks, you will never see. I think it's almost impossible to see them just standing here. How would you rate the danger of, hippo, of uh, crocs? Greater. Greater than hippos? Much greater, yes. They're a, wow. carniv they're, they're a carnivore. And they're also a carnivore who is accustomed or is regularly eating man. So our adventure in them may be uh, full of surprises, huh? Once you get below the water, um, it's a new and dangerous world. But we will be watching. It is high noon when hippo colonies customarily slumber. They blow out used air, suck in fresh, as in sonorous siesta. Families congregate at the shallow end of the pool to rest their feet on the soft bottom. During these short naps, the barbus fish are most active. Grooming the hippos with their sucker mouths, the fish vacuum the blimp-like bodies of algae, leeches, and parasites. This is the most propitious time to dive. OK, Murray, show us where they are and indicate with your fingers the number of meters. I don't think they'll give us any warning, though. Cousteau and Watson will observe and direct the dive from an elevated vantage point. Sentinel hippos snort, and the siesta is over. Cautiously, they flank the animals. The herd is very restive. Philippe and Bernard wait for them to settle. In an intimidation display, a female puffs herself up to appear taller than the divers to frighten them away. In this matriarchal society, females, more plump and pink than males, often patrol the perimeters. <coughs> we suddenly see the approach of a submerged hippo. It surfaces right in front of our divers. It becomes a standoff. The hippo dives, and Philip follows. Filming is difficult once more, for as the animals prowl the bottom, they stir up the accumulation of hippo waste in the pool. Where you find an abundance of natural nutrients, you find fat fish. Where you find fish, you'll often find crocodiles. Bernard tries to herd it away toward the other end of the pool. The great number of hippos concentrated in such a small pool creates confusion. Bernard warily follows a large female. She kicks up her heels, showing her even-toed hoofs, which place her in the giraffe, camel, and gazelle group. She suddenly stops. It appears she's about to confront Bernard. But then she moves on. Mm. 
Philippe and Bernard ease toward a group of hippos cornered in the shallows. A juvenile turns toward Philippe's camera and has his picture taken. The hippos give way to man and flee toward the deep end of the pool. The divers follow. Bernard touches a fleeing hippo and then cannot resist petting her baby. It was not a very good idea and it triggers a protective mother's response. She runs rapidly along the bottom to rejoin her baby and creates an enormous wake. From here, it's amazing the speed with which they go. Four meters in the midstream. Four meters, right here. Fast it. Going upstream. At the deep end of the pool, the water is fresh and clear. Hungry fish follow the family of hippos. Here in deeper water, the river horses feel more secure. They move with surprising grace. After our dive, mating activity is resumed. As with many species, a mock fight precedes union. Our divers think this may be a September song. A previously cast out old male has found once more a young female at least approachable and possibly willing. The African sky suddenly becomes spangled with the wings of bee eaters, feeding upon swarms of insects as they return to their homes. On the shores of this distant Eden, these delicate birds find refuge in this cliff, nesting above the high water mark, safe from snakes. This is one uh, other example, and it's a striking one, it's only one of them, of the importance of what we have called here this inner shoreline. Yes. Uh, because I believe that all this river system in the continents act a, bit, a little bit like the roots of the ocean, yes. where the ocean digs into the continent to get its uh, renewal and as well as uh, the chemicals that are essential for ocean shore life as well. Yes. And here in the inner shorelines, the competition between man and animals extend even for such species as these birds. I think it's, by the time I've seen the hippo, the croco, these birds, Everything that really lives in the wildlife near the, the water, that needs water system for survival, is in competition with man. Well, what would happen if, if a village was, you know, a native village was uh, installed somewhere around here? Well, they, they, these animals would certainly vanish. No, I'm well, quite sure. They would leave, they would go somewhere else, I guess. Yes, they'd be crowded as a result. First thing, there would be temporary overcrowding. Yeah. Because man and animals are very rarely in the sort of harmony that allows them to exist together on a riverbank. Yeah. 
there would be people washing here every day. They'd build tracks, they'd destroy this cliff. Any man-made changes is much too fast. Evolution takes tens of thousands of years or millions of years to produce a new species or to adapt a new species. Well, yeah. And anything made by man is far too fast. It's not the same order of magnitude. But, no, I think I'll modify that a little. M using technology, yeah. man has stepped outside the normal orders of magnitude, That's right. describing the rates of change in evolution. And animals without technology have been cut away. The, the ground has been cut away. They will never catch up with man. On this living river, as the descending equatorial sun showers energy upon all living things, an infant reaches for the last warming rays. The river shorelines are the roots of the ocean. They must be cherished and protected, for they are the womb of life, blessed through the providential wedding of land and water. The hippo grazes through whatever grass he can find. This hippo's natural range is now planted with houses. Having become accustomed to human beings, he continues to come to graze. But unlike other hippos, he grazes by day, sweating blood as his system exudes red pigment to protect his delicate skin. Bernard, who dove with wild hippos, knows this altered animal, making use of man's sidewalk, is the most dangerous of all. Hippo! Hippo! Modern marinas and hippos are not compatible. This hippo, victim of the competition for the shoreline, is a pitiable curiosity. Tragic to see. However, men are rallying to set aside remaining water holes, lake and river shores for free hippos, crocos, and their finned and winged companions, so that we may defer the day when hippo will have no place to hide. 